it's a lovely day today allow me to welcome you to in-depth talk with shine as you do know i'm shine i love the spotlight welcome to nafsi tv the show where we're going to be talking about everything regarding the line of work of our guests our guests on the show are going to be lovely amazing people who have made impact in our country as a whole and on today's episode we have a beautiful woman of honor and valor who has made her state and country proud chief mrs falano did i get that right yes olamide falano chief mrs olamide falano is the special advisor to the governor on gender matters. Am I right? Very correct. I have been preparing for this interview because I am amazed at the amount of work she has done. You're going to find out. You're going to find out. Let's get into it. Let me start from my most curious questions. Our research on you. Okay. You, um, you went to FUTA. Yes. You had your Masters in Futa on food storage technology. Yes. You had your PhD in Adekule Ajashin. It's ongoing. On plants, plant science and biotechnology. biotechnology. Ongoing, please. Great. How are you in the role of gender matters? How did you find yourself in this line of work? Thank you. Well, for me, gender issues is um, a thing of passion. Uh, it's a sphere where I feel... Um, uh, I have a strong urge to make a change. It's a sphere where I believe that, there is, that we have a lot of gaps and then we have a lot of needs to, you know, uh, a lot of needs that are available in that sector. It's a sphere of power because, um, uh, power because it's, a, you know, we find gender issues among people who have no power. Gender is nothing of education. It's not by, uh, it's not by educational qualification. It's rather by passion and gradually by experience gathered over the years working on gender issues um, across across board and across the, the country. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So you, you mentioned experience being a main point. Would you say ex your experience is the driving force for you to partake in this sort of issues? In the yeah, country? well, experience is, like I say, the best teacher. Yes. <laughs> And um, that's why I use a, a lot of experience because um, I've had personal um, experiences on gender issues okay. that actually fired up my passion to ensure that we make a change. Mm -hmm. And of course, these experiences come up every day. And I'm the kind of person who would never sit back and fold their hands and watch when things go wrong. Rather, I always have a desire to you know, make my own impact towards the, positive, the desired goal or desired um, destination that I feel that um, whatever situation should actually be. And my first time experience on gender issues was when I was in the university. Okay. Um, then I, as an undergraduate, I had interest in student journalism, um, sought to contest for student general presidency. And I could recall that it was a whole of gender issues entirely. Yeah. You know, it was then the school institution was I was a male dominator. We had more male students than we had female students then, wow. and um, a lot of the male could not could not um, uh, stick the fact that a female student was actually seeking to lead this university and uh, lead the student body as the president. Mm -hmm. And the discussions, the um, issues, uh, the fights, the quarrels, and all of that began there. And I realized that these issues actually are deeper than it may seem then. And, I, and whatever, whatever I saw, whatever challenges I faced then, were not surface issues, but rather they were issues that were of, of patriarchy, of culture, of um, societal uh, perceptions that are deeply etched in our society, that are etched in the way we bring up our girls and our boys, etched in the way we marry up our children, either male, both male and female, etched in the way we relate with our spouses, in the way we relate with our in-laws. And, you know, it's all around us. And that is why, you know, over time, I developed this interest and this passion to always do whatever is needed to, you know, was making better the gender plight of so many others to, or who could have gone through what I also went through in the past. Beautiful work, my beautiful. A while ago, you were the executive director to a girls and women research and yes. also the project officer for a development agency that was assisted by the World Bank. Yes. Before you got to all the stages, what was your support regarding this line? How were you able, able to support your passion and vision for girls and women at large? All right, so after, after my university days, I worked for a few years, very few years, and intentionally resigned to set up the organization, which you mentioned, Girls to Women Research and Development Center. Of course, one out of my passion, you know, in, the, in, in this regard. 
And after the organization was set up, uh, uh, we began to implement activities in the line of gender issues, uh, implement activities on, on, on awareness creation, on prevention of gender-based violence, on systemic um, uh, training and gender mainstreaming, you know, across various sectors. And this also continued even when I also joined uh, the, um, the agency for the World Bank Assistance Agency, also working in line of gender issues while supporting vulnerable populations, you know, towards getting their voices and getting their, their, their thoughts and aspirations, you know, taken care of, you know, in, within any project um, uh, circle. So I want to say that um, uh, through the organization, I was able to actually achieve some of these aspirations and also achieve some positive results you know, in the line of, of, of my work over the years. That's very interesting. Yes, you are the special advisor to the current government administration on gender matters. How has been the support from the governor? Oh, well, first I want to commend uh, Mr. Governor, Arakuri uh, Huluaro Tibiodoni Akiri Delu, because it's somebody that I've always described as um, a gender specialist to the core. It's foremost um, uh, uh, if or she, because it's a man who believe so much in equity and development. And, um, and like I always say, when you have um, somebody who is a development person and also who is also a gender person, they can be sure they, that will definitely have um, equitable development across board. He's a man who um, has supported openly every intervention that has to do with, um, you know, prospering the gender future of our state. He's a man who believes so much in gender mainstreaming across all levels and across all sectors of governments. Uh, for, for, for example, Ondo uh, said during this current administration had the first female secretary of the state government, an SSG, a female. Ondo has, um, uh, has, has, has currently women leading uh, key agencies, key uh, ministries and departments within, within, within the state, like um, uh, uh, various uh, some ministry, ministry of health, as an example, uh, the accountant general, you know, and so many other core ministries and agencies within the bureaucracy that are now led by women, which was not what we used to have, you know. In the past, we used to have few women leading, you know, getting to the top of their career, but now we have a good number of women who are also getting to the top of their career within the, within the bureaucracy, and that is gender mainstreaming in the bureaucratic setting. Then, in the political field, apart from having a female SSG, the Mr. Governor has also deemed fit to ensure that the, the cabinet also has a good number of women appointed to serve in the executive council of Ondo State, and that is highly commendable. The more women we have who contribute their own quota to the development of the state, the more women that are also visible at the national level, the more women that we know that yes have the capacity to even do more. You know, when given even greater opportunities in the future. And that is one of the reasons why I said earlier that Mr. Governor is a if for she. In addition to this, Mr. Governor has also ensured that any program and intervention that has a gender face receives maximum support, both in policy wise and also financial wise. It is one thing for you to say things, you know, when a government makes proclamations, oh, I will build roads, I will do this and that. And there is no policy finance, there's no policy backing, there's no financial backing. There are more of just uh, words <laughs> that would um, that can be forgotten easily. But the very moment you're also able to translate these words and uh, you know thoughts into financial documents, which is the budget, and then ensure that this this document also sees the light of the day through your approvals, then that means that you are not just saying it; you are actually doing it. So Mr. Governor doesn't just say to say it; he's a talk and do, like we always call it. He's a talk and do governor. And finally, on on, on this question. Uh, this is about the first time that we're having a cabinet ranking position, an executive position on gender in the state and also across the nation. Which means that, you know, having an executive position on gender means that we can actually directly influence policies on gender. We can, develop, we can enhance, we can bring up policies, push these policies on that are actually gender related. We can ensure that gender issues come to the front, front burner and we all can run along with it and ensure that the mainstreaming is across board. We can develop our communities better, you know, through our gender activities across, across the state. So Mr. Governor has done so well for women and also has done so well to ensure that we have that equitable development which Ondo State actually deserves. Wow, wow. This, this is amazing news. This is amazing news. Thank I'm you. I'm so impressed with the work you and the governor have been doing. Thank now, you. to ask some sensitive questions, your office, 
the I know that gender matters include sexism, patriarchy issues, and all of that. Has there been any issues on human trafficking? Because we definitely know that women and children are the Victims. instruments they use for this. Thank has, you. Has there been any issues? Yes, we've had some some cases of um, individuals who have been trafficked. And of course, you know, the trafficking in person is a huge crime, a yeah. huge crime against uh, humanity. Uh, my office has collaborated uh, at, at various points with um, key offices, uh, uh, civil defense, NAPTIP, you know, towards sensitization on uh, human trafficking. Then again, we also have a working collaboration with Ondo State Ministry of uh, Regional Integration and Diaspora Matters, where any time we come across any issue of, of any individual, who has been trafficked or who has been trafficked, we move into us to see how we can salvage the situation. Recently, early this year, about two months ago, we had a um, successful repatriation of an indigenous of Ondo state, in, I won't mention where, who was trafficked to Iran. She was there for some, for some time and um, uh, later on, we got to know she sent a distress call home to her mother who had not seen her for months, that she was about to be sold, you know, for life. Wow. Yeah. I know by the time we got the distress call, the mother ran the, the next day to my office. And um, through the, co the collaboration with the Ministry of Region, Integration and Diaspora, we were able to contact uh, the embassy over there and had her opportunity back to the state. So right now she's back with her family, she's back with her parents and her family, and she, she's, she's okay. And we, we, do, we do not just repatriate them, we also seek how to also support them to settle down because if they come back to the country, how do they settle back? What do they do? So we, we support the repatriation of, of, of such individuals when we get the distress calls and we are scared that they are actually from on those states. And then follow up also, we supporting such individuals with um, whatever is required in our own little way to settle back into life and um, back into uh, the country. So um, we work on that. At any time when we have the opportunity, we encourage our youth to look before they leap. I never believe that the grass is greener on the other side. Yeah. A lot of time we find youth who just want to jackpa. And some in what you want to jackpa, they jada no. <laughs> and mm. some, the lucky ones are able to jackpa da. <laughs> Those who jackpa da, you know, are able to come back to the country, mm -hmm. still whole. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some that by the time they are coming back, they, they are already maimed, they've lost a hand, they've lost an eye. You know, and they are not coming back whole again. Wow. And so, on, by the time they, they were able to do it, they even a jackpot. You know, they just go from, you know, from one level of of um uh, of uh, uh you know, of slavery to another, and they may never be able to find themselves or come back to the country again. So we encourage our young people, please, calm down. The nation is hard, yes, but things are getting better. There are policies that are there to help you, you know, to find your fit. The government right now has, is, has come up with policies that will ensure that youths who have the interest in entrepreneurship can get access to funds, you know, to begin their businesses. And those who already have existing businesses can also access funds to make their businesses better. So a lot of things are being done by the current administration at the federal and also at the state level to alleviate the plight of our young people. We are not unaware that we have a youthful population and we also have needs out there. You know, the government is trying, but of course, we should also not, not as, as young people, as youth also, we shouldn't outrun time by being impatient, you know, and trying to, uh, you know, speed up the, 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 the harm of time. Final note on, on, on the question uh, you raised about um, trafficking. My office has a weekly radio program okay. that, we, that we host on Crest um, 106.1 FM. Okay. Uh, we call it the Voice Radio Program. And on that program... From time to time, we also use a lot of new to also educate our young people. We bring in life experiences of individuals who have traveled out of the country and have met, do I say Waterloo, you know, or met huge challenges, you know. I'm not saying that traveling out is bad, you know, but if you have to travel out, you must be sure of the route where you're going through. You must be sure of the links, you know. You must be sure that you're not going there to, um, for, to do work that is, not, that is, um, that is undisclosed. Now, recently, we got this information that a lot of our young people travel to other African countries under the guise of getting them jobs. On getting there, they are made to also work like, you know, daily laborers. The kind of thing they will never do in their own country. Wow. So why would you leave Nigeria and go to another African country, perhaps a lesser African country, because if we are the giant of Africa, mm -hmm. that means there's no nation as big as us in Africa. Yes. So why would you leave Nigeria and go to a less African country to, to do many jobs, to work on somebody else's farm. That is 
turning in oneself into slaves for nothing. It's not worth it. So please, I plead with our young people, our youth out there, please look before you leap. And um, of course, uh, um, before I close on, close on this question, a lot of times when our youth want to travel out, you know, for whatever reasons, they spend a lot of money. Some sell with the property they have, some sell property of their family members, mm -hmm. some, you know, some gather, save for up to a year. So why save up for a year to sell yourself into slavery? Rather, why not sit down and ask yourself, what are the, what are the things I can do that can lead me to wealth in this nation? With that determination, I can assure you, you can achieve it. Yes, yes. I hope we're all listening and we're all taking notes from what she's saying. I, I, I really hope that our youth get to learn from everything we're discussing here. I pray now, so too. We're still on sensitive topics. Um, we know about rape and we know that there's, there's a lot of victims from this particular rape uh, issue. There's this thing called um, victim's guilt. Victim's guilt that we read of and we've heard from interviews with victims. Your office, what plans does it have for rape victims especially? Thank you. Now, on the issue of um, gender-based violence, I'll begin by saying that um, the state currently has a law that we call Violence Against Person Probation Law. Now, this law is there to protect victims of all forms of gender-based violence and sexual assault, which rape is inclusive. Now, one of the things also that this law also does is we have this part of the law where we have um, this um, sexual assault, reg uh, assault um, uh, uh, register, you know, and what that register seeks to do is to also compile names of individuals who are sexual offenders, sexual offenders register, and uh, when, we, uh, when we identify them, we publish them because our aim is to ensure that we push the, the blame of rape and assault, the blame, the guilt away from the victims to the, the, uh, to the offender. In the past, we have offenders because they are male most times, you know, who will go about boasting, oh yes, I deal with that girl, you know, boasting and walking about free. Mm -hmm. But now we know that um, when we identify such individuals, we're able to use the ambit of the law to deal with them decisively and publish their faces across, you know, wherever, everywhere in their community. So people can identify them that this individual is a sexual offender and parents can advise their daughters not to move close to such people. Uh, you know, parents can uh, warn their sons not to get entangled with such individuals. You know, uh, individuals like um, our company, schools can be careful about employing such people in their school settings so that um, they don't come into school and then begin to rape children, you know, uh, in the school. You know, so they get to face a lot of social punishment for their crime because mm. there are faces everywhere. Mm. So what we are trying to do is to ensure that we push the blame from the victims to the offender and ensure that the victim also has that closure that, coming, that comes from knowing that the, the, the culprit has been decisively dealt with. You know, there's this closure that comes when you know that, yes, somebody is fighting for you, somebody is fighting your cause. And that is what the VAP law has been doing in the state. Now, the VAP law is not just a law on its own because if you have a law and um, you don't have, uh, you don't have, um, what it is required to make the law work, it may just sit on the desk for as long as possible. So the state also has established the Ondo State Agency Against Gender-Based Violence, which also is armed and equipped and well-funded to deal with any issue of gender-based violence in any part of the entire state. And what the agency does is to ensure that the moment there is, an, there is a report of any sexual assault or any sexual crime, you know, or other forms of gender-based violence, talk about female genital mutilation, uh, talk about um, other forms of personal abuse, talk about wife battery and the intimate partner violence, you know, so many of them, you know, that, that exist. The moment there is a report of any of such, the agency's officials swing into action towards, you know, uh, dealing with the issue and getting support for the victim as quickly as possible. That's amazing. And I'm very happy to hear about all these laws and plans put in place for our women and children. Thank now, you. regarding the awareness, apart from the radio station, I'm sure a lot of citizens are not fully aware that we now have a voice for us in the executive level. How is the awareness plan? How, how is the plan to, you know, create more awareness about your office and what you do? Thank you. A lot of awareness is ongoing across, um, across the state towards ensuring that as many people as possible know about um, what the government is doing about um, the VAP law, 
about um, uh, the, the systems in place to, to checkmate all forms of gender-based violence. So I can assure you that a lot, a lot of awareness is, is ongoing across the state. My office, as an example, already has trained uh, gender desk officers across the 18 local governments. Really? Yes. And these officers are actually uh, officers from the LGA in the offices. Mm -hmm. And what they do also is to also carry out gender-specific activities, you know, across the state. And we monitor through my office because they send in weekly reports. We have, we send their reports in real time through our platform. So I get to see what happens in all the LGAs as activities of gender gender desk officers. So we have all, these, all of these activities going on. And I can assure you that um, the awareness about gender issues is ongoing, is increasing. And where we are now is not where we used to be, you know, some a few years back. That is, that is amazing. That is amazing. Back to some sensitive questions. I'm very personally grateful that your office is in the executive level. If we have issues where the victim, um, the, the victim's offender or the victim's um, assaulter is someone of great background, we understand that nepotism is something that we cannot curb easily. So how, how does your office arrange go about, about this if the offender if the victim the crimi the criminal is someone of great background in the country how does your office get to them thank you now um for for me for the agency the law is no respect of 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 of, of um, caliber the law is blind to your status and that is just basic uh, but i'll also emphasize by giving an example um some like earlier this year there was um the case of rape of a, of a young girl. And um, uh, when the issue was reported, the culprit was, um, the culprit was um, apprehended. He went through some, of some close people to me and, oh, somebody just called me, oh, honorable, um, this, there's this issue, there's this younger brother of mine and all that, who was alleged, it's not true. Of course, it's never true. So I told the person that for calling me shows that you are an accomplice to the crime. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, do you do the same thing? He said, no. So if you are sure you don't do the same thing, then please do not call me on this issue. Let the law take its course. And that is the way it has been. And for that singular reason, hardly do they call me, you know, to drop, you know, uh, to drop allegations or to, or to wade in when the person actually has been found guilty or even before, or, or found to have committed a crime. And uh, we just need to, need to, to get to the court and, 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 and obtain a punishment for his crime. So um, for, for us, we do not look at who you are because um, ignorance of the law is not an excuse. There's nobody who does evil that doesn't know that whatever he is doing is evil. So you do not even need, it doesn't need to be written down or you don't need to have read through the entire law, book of law before you know that it's not good to steal. You do not need to read through the book of law or the Nigerian constitution, you know, to for you to know that um, it is a crime for you to, um, to to kill, for you to rape. You do not you do not need for you to infringe another person's right. You do not need a, a book of law to know that. These are things that are just basic. These are things that you know you and I know. But for the fact that crime is mostly committed in hidden, you know, in in corners, in uh, a lot of people try to also hide and dodge the punishment. And that is why we have the law, and we have the law enforcement agencies to also check me such individuals so that they don't do the same thing again and cause maximum damage to society. So in my office and also the agency, there is we dispassionately ensure that culprits are you know, brought to book, and wherever you are, go ahead and face the music so long as you have committed a crime. The crime, the crime. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure that whoever is listening has their mind at rest that no matter what happens, they are going to be vindicated. Yes, so we know that you contested for governorship at a point. How was the acceptability? Thank you. Um, 2016, I was a governorship candidate for Democratic Post Party. And um, we went around the state campaigning, working. And then I realized that a lot of women also feel that we are ripe as a state to have key leaders who are women. A lot of men believe that if a woman has a capacity, they are also ready to support. Uh, but of course, you will know that politics is beyond acceptability. Mm -hmm. Your party also matters. But I know that on one-on-one -on -one basis, I, I received a huge level of, level of support you know, from across board. People who were, who were excited, people who were amazed, those who were encouraged, those who told me, okay, fine, they'll go and encourage you. This is, you know, who were encouraged. This will also encourage their own daughters, you know, 
to keep their head high and keep their shoulders high as well. You know, so I made a lot. I received a lot of support across across, across board, and um, of course, this also translated into votes. You know, by the time the election uh, uh, came about, eventually. So I, I want to believe that the environment is gradually becoming more ripe for us to have a female governor in Ondo State, and I can assure you that come next election, you can be sure that um, we might, we hope to have a female that will lead as um, the next governor of Ondo State. And for one, if I may drop this. I will be in the race by the grace of God. Wow, wow. That is amazing news to look forward to. Thank amazing you. news to look forward to. And we hope for the best. Thank you. Yes. So we do know that and when we hear a woman is involved in gender matters, people call her a feminist, people call her the enemy of men, but you are a happily married woman. Yes. How do you go around this? How does it work? How is the support from your husband and male, the male um, but, um, supporters around you? Well, um, to begin with, I, I always counsel young ladies that um, when you're growing, just be yourself. When you are yourself, you attract the kind of person who understands you for who you are. Do not hide and pretend to be what you're not. Because if you do, you also lose the opportunity of meeting individuals who will see the value in you and will know that, okay, yes, yeah, you didn't just start this today. Mm -hmm. So I started activ activism when I was much younger, as like I said earlier. My husband met me also, you know met me the way I was then, you know, as an individual, as a young lady who had a purpose, who had vision, who also had the passion, you know, and the energy to also drive it through. So um, over the years, he has also been a support. He has been a huge support. Uh, he has never for once put me down or said, okay, no, I cannot have how you do this. But rather, each time I come up with an aspiration, he's been very supportive. And I will say, he's my luck, you know. And um, I, I, But like I said, it also stems from Young ladies also bringing out their, you know, developing their, you know, identifying their potentials early enough. You know, when you identify your potentials, when you are true to yourself, you can be sure that you would only marry the person who your cap fits. Hmm. 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 That's very nice. So being yourself, the round peg will enter the round hole. Exactly. Everything will be fit. That's very nice. So what plans should we expect from your office in the coming months? Thank you. Well, the coming months, um, in a very short while, we hope to solidify the state, state gender policy, mm -hmm. uh, which will speak to what happens on gender issues across all the MDAs uh, in, in, within the state. We hope to um, be able to um, also increase our awareness creation about gender. We hope to also be able to you know, walk around, we will work, work, work with our girls towards you know, greater awareness creation, greater um, build up for our adolescent girls across the state. We hope to ensure that also a balance with our boys as well because um, by ensuring that uh, they also have the right knowledge and mindset about various issues as, as, as they grow. Keep in mind that gender is not only about um, women, it's about women, men and special persons in society. So we also hope to also do more with our special persons you know, across the state. As an example, we had a program recently where we ensure that um, uh, you know, we're able to support some special persons you know, towards earning some skills in the state. And then again, the, so with, with the vulnerable population, we have a program in our office where we identify vulnerable individuals who are really, really vulnerable, especially, uh, especially girls who are pregnant and who have dropped out of school which is a problem in the society because a lot of times when adolescent girls get pregnant and drop out, that is always the end of the education, especially in, the, in, in communities. The, the education stops. They probably the, vic the corporate, the personal media pregnant may say, okay, I, I, I have no money. So she's just left to fend for the child by, by herself and she may never be able to get the regain education. So what, what, what we have done is across the states also identify, across the entire district rather, to identify such young ladies Organize um, tailor-made trainings for them so that that will support them to, you know, through the period of pregnancy, putting to bed and all of that. And then by the time they're now able to get themselves, their life back together again, they also push them gradually towards going back to school through our counseling so that they can regain the, the, the right of education even after they put to bed. And that's also one of the gender issues that we're also tackling through my office. That's amazing. And we're very happy that you've let us know about all of this. Thank you. So last question before we let you go. I'm sure that we've used up a lot of your time. How do we get to your office? How do we contact your office? Some people have, um, should I say, some sort of trauma, PTSD issues with 
law enforcement agencies due to whatever they faced in the past and you are telling us now that you are the stronghold the voice that we need how do we contact you without going through any other people all right so you can always reach me in my office my office is at government as that one is at some um, power building in government's house you can also reach me through my email i'll drop the email olamide.falano.gov.ng you can reach me through those two means at any time i'll drop your mail i'll respond immediately and if you get to my office at any time, we have an open door policy. Thank you very much, ma'am. We're you. grateful and honored that you honored our invitation to come Thank to you. the studio today. Thank you very Thank much, Thank you Shai. very much. Thank you. Until next time. Yes, that is it today on In-Depth Talk with Shine. I have enjoyed this interview and I have learned so much. I hope you have as well. Until next time, join me on Offset TV. Mwah. <laughs>